Over the decades, we've had the privilege on 21st Century Radio of speaking with Dr. Matthew Fox, a very well-known, preeminent theologian and best-selling author, and importantly, leading spiritual activist who has stirred the hearts and souls of thousands of others across multi-generations and ethnicities. His many books explore creation spirituality and its four paths, a tradition born in part from the teachings clarified by Thomas Merton, Meister Eckhart of the 13th century as well, whom Fox acknowledges as his mentors. Matthew Fox joins us this hour to continue our several decades-long conversations about meaningful change in society, the emergence of a vibrant spiritual path that may no longer be monastic, but is every bit as vigorously filled with love of creation and honoring that love through intentional and compassionate right action. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. Matthew Fox. <laughs> Never quite Thank sure what to call you. I always feel like it's Brother Matthew. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. It's good to be back with you. Well, thank you for joining us. You're certainly very busy. I've been reading through three recent titles of yours, A Way to God, Thomas Burton's Creation Spirituality Journey, Stations of the Cosmic Christ with Bishop Mark Andrus, and you're soon to be released this summer entitled, your work entitled, Order of the Sacred Earth, an Intergenerational Vision of Love and Action, which is co-authored with Skylar Wilson and Jennifer Listing. What is the thread that runs through through all three of these works? <laughs> well, that's a question no one's asked me before. <laughs> but uh, well, the thread is, let's wake up. Uh, that's what spirituality is about, I think. Let's live deeper, deeper lives. And let's draw on uh, the wisdom of the earth and the wisdom of the, our ancestors, uh, the, deeper, the deeper rivers, uh, the deeper uh, lineage, of our creation spirituality and and of which is really found in all the the deeper dimensions of, of religious traditions. All the religions agree that creation is sacred, and uh, that includes human nature. And we should um, operate like it is. And uh, obviously, with global warming and and uh, the vast denial of global warming going on in our political culture and in some religions uh, in our culture, uh, it's a very dangerous place uh, to find ourselves in. And it's no way to bless our, our children and our our descendants are going to come after us to leave them uh, an earth that is despoiled and that is broken. And um, so it's about finding what's deepest in the human heart and our passion for justice, our passion for compassion and, um, and creativity and putting that, putting that to work. Uh, I was at a conference this past summer of 150 scientists on an island for, for a week, and um, it occurred to me when I landed that the, the air was filled with despair. And um, uh, so I, I addressed that when it was my time to talk, and um, I pointed out Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century said, despair is the most dangerous of all sins. It's not the worst. He said injustice is the worst. But when you're in despair, you... You don't care about yourself, and you sure don't care about others. Despair drives compassion out the door. So um, by the end of the week, that was it was good. Some young scientists got up and talked about what is happening, what can happen. Um, for example, one fellow said that uh, we could be putting a floating island a thousand miles off of um, the Atlantic coast, so it wouldn't be in anyone's backyard. No one would see it. But on that island, you could have um, all these um, uh, windmills generating enough electricity for all of North America. We wouldn't need any gas, oil, or coal. And uh, he said, we could do that now. We have the technology. Um, another young scientist got up and said that if we could quadruple uh, the amount of uh, battery storage that we that we have now. In fact, he said we've doubled it now, so we only have to double it one more time. He said all the southern continents, which are, of course, the poorest continents and also receive the most sun, they could leapfrog over the Industrial Revolution and be entirely solar uh, solar run and uh, because you could store uh, the sun uh, uh, so, so efficiently that way. So, you know, the, the hope is in human creativity, but we have to care. We have to care enough to... to um, to generate creativity and generate alternatives. So, so those are a few issues that 
come up to me when we're talking about Croatian spirituality. You know, it's interesting. I just finished a four-year odyssey with what are called white spirit animals, which my book is called White Spirit Animals, Prophets of Change. And this was looking at um, perennial and wisdom, indigenous people's traditions around these sacred animals, the white bear, the white lion, et cetera, the white wolf, the white elephant, the white buffalo. And what at the end of my work with them, and much of it was done through dreams, something I want to ask you about, the one thing they said to me was humanity needs to restore it's matrilineal tradition, meaning, and it's not a political or feminist statement, it's it's about an ethos of care. They said what we've lost, and you mentioned this is care, is this ethos of care that would, of course, put women and children and our Mother Earth at the center of all things. What is it that's in our way? I mean, you know, it seems under this administration our shadow has come to the surface, and we don't know what to do with it. That's right. Well, I think the reptilian brain is in the way, and, of course, uh, with it, um, our our capacity for greed and for power, for power's sake, and for a denial. I mean, I'm just astounded by the amount of denial that we're capable of as a species. I was I was in Florida, part of a, a conference on a, uh, seas rising, global change in the rising seas. It was a year ago, January. So January 2016, it was during the presidential election. And... Um, the first week was scientists to get up and had pictures of slides of Florida. Today, 10 years from now, chop. 20 years from now, chop, chop. 30 years from now, chop, chop, chop. I mean, Florida will be disappearing. And yet at the very time, there were two presidential candidates from Florida, previous governor and the current senator, and the current governor, all three in, in public denial about climate change. And I went to South Miami, and there are four inches of water on the sidewalk. So it's amazing how humans and our our organizations can um, live in in a, in a make believe world, and of course ignore science and uh, and create a bubble and and, and just be in complete denial. So, I, I, Meister Eckhart, one of my favorite mystics, and you referred to, he, he said that that is the denial of denial. Mm-hmm. So if we're stuck in denial, divinity is nowhere around because truth is nowhere around. So, um, so there's that, and and I like the the that language of the um, ethos of care and the matrilineal tradition. You know, there's a reason why in both the Hebrew language and the Arabic language, the word for compassion comes from the word word for womb. So the mammal people with wombs are, um, what can I say? They're the archetype of compassion. Yeah, no the, question. The mother. Yeah. But also the father. I mean, we see pictures of chimpanzees pulling lice from one another. And so, you know, kinship, family, we take care of each other. But we can turn our back on that, too, if we're overcome by greed or by the reptilian brain, which is about winning. But it's about uh, being on, on top, being number one. So I think the triumph of the reptilian brain is a triumph of the shadow side of patriarchy, and it's killing the planet. And it's killing exactly. The yeah, I, I think you put that very well. And when we look at the, you know, I, and I love what you write in your book, A Way to God, Thomas Merton's Creation Spirituality Journey, and the work you've done your whole lifetime in um, celebrating creation in the way so many of us feel. And you know, I wanted to share a really strange little story with you very quickly. In 1984, it's the only apparition experience I've ever had. I've had many visions, but this was a literal apparition of the Blessed Mother. I'm Jewish, by the way. The Blessed Mother stands there and tells me, I want this, it was very short, I want you to start the new order of the world mother. I, I had no idea what, what what I could do with that, what I was supposed to do with it. I opened a holistic healing center. Here we are 30-some years later, and I get this beautiful book called Order of the Sacred Earth by Matthew oh, Fox. Wow. And I went, oh. my goodness, there's the new order of the world mother. It's just a much better wow. name, Order of the Sacred <laughs> Earth. I owe a very personal notion mention of gratitude to you, Matthew and to all of you who are forming this, because I feel like you have fulfilled this instruction I was given, and I'm happy to help support you in any ways I can. Well, that's really an exciting story. Wow, it takes my breath away. That's beautiful. Yeah, if if, uh, our Earth is our mother, after all, and um, that's indigenous language, but it's also uh, Francis of Assisi and many others. But um, 
and it's just common sense. I mean, uh, we are nurtured, obviously, and dependent, interdependent on Mother Earth. But that's amazing that that happened to you years ago, and that um, you see a sort of echo or even fulfillment in the order of the sacred earth. Oh, right? very well, much talk, so. Should we talk about the order of the sacred earth then? And you can. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I want to encourage our audience to visit your website, www.orderofthesacredearth.org. And I I want to talk about that for a moment, because I think you've sort of like integrated all these amazing things you have journeyed with and taught for so many decades to so many thousands of people worldwide. Now it's sort of commingling with the true activist awareness of the millennialist. And I'd like for a moment, if you would, to share with us what you see in this generation that perhaps others haven't manifested in quite the same way. Well, it is true. Um, I'm, the, I'm the elder, and I, I had a dream uh, two, was it two years ago, and the dream woke me up at four in the morning, and it said, do it. And then I had a dream that there was a command like that in capital letters with four exclamation points. <laughs> the do it thing was to start in order. And um, we came up with the name of Order of the Sacred Earth. But um, it's a spiritual, not a religious order, meaning it will not be um, beholden to any particular religious headquarters, uh, but it's open to people of all spiritual traditions and none. Atheists are welcome, too. If if one is open to the the one vow that will bind people together, and that vow is, I promise to be the best lover of Mother Earth and the best defender of Mother Earth that I can be. That's the one vow. That's what binds us together. And it can be, as I say, a, a variety of traditions and also of professions mm-hmm. and of lifestyles and all the rest. Uh, you can be a Buddhist monk, or I was with... Um, some Hindu monks recently in an ashram, and I brought it up to them, and, and they, many of them seemed interested and so forth. Or, of course, of course, the majority of people relay people. The directors, as we get off the ground, are young. One is 28-year-old woman, one a 33-year-old man. Because I believe just what you're talking about, the younger generation has to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they should be in places of leadership. Now they need elders, they need mentors. It's not just charging uh, straight ahead, but and that's why we call it intergenerational. Uh, this is what we strive for, but that's how we're putting it together. We want it to mirror the, uh, we don't want it to be hierarchical. We want to mirror the self-organizing universe. So we want it to be self-organizing. So on the solstice last month, December 21st, people took their, their vows. Uh, that was our first ceremony of vow taking. So we did it in Berkeley at a Buddhist center. About 80 people showed up of, of, of great variety. One woman was an atheist, a 26-year-old woman, and she donated. She wanted to take it out because she wants a community that she can believe in that shares her values. And, um, and they did it in Los Asos, California, in Orange County. They did it in Boulder. There's a group in St. Petersburg and a group in Des Plaines, Illinois. Now, these are the places we know about, but uh, the word's getting out. And a book will appear publicly in about in in the spring, late spring. And um, yeah, we you know when I look at the history of of religion, especially in the West, religion often finds itself in dark times, like we're in today religiously. But what happens is orders spring up. So in the third century, you had the movement of the desert fathers and and the desert mothers. These were young people who went out in the wilderness rather than hang around in the corrupt uh, society in the cities. And then in the 5th century, you had St. Benedict and the Sisters Classica launching the Benedictine monastic order, which really did uh, provide a lot of stability for the theatic society for about 800 years. And then in the early 13th century, you had St. Francis of Assisi and Dominic, they were contemporaries, launching a new kind of order because the monastic order had gone quite corrupt. It was overly identified with the feudal system, which is breaking up. 16th century, of course, you had the Protestant Reformation, and I think that in many ways you can look at that as a series of lay orders. Um, and then you have the Jesuits that century also, all of them responding to the corruption in the Vatican, of course. But here we are in the 21st century, you look around and all you see are people leaving church. <laughs> right, right. Especially the young people. They're empty, and they're going to be more empty. And churches are closing down. Last year, our Catholic Church closed over 100 churches in Manhattan, and they're still at it this year. <laughs> so 
But what's happening? I don't see anything happening. So, so I think that helps to explain why it's time for something like an order, because orders in both East and West, you have orders in the East too, they're more flexible. We don't need a new church. We don't need a new religion. Time's running out on us. It's not time for that kind of thing. But an order is very flexible. And um, so I say, well, why not give this a shot? And I'm, I'm excited that you had a dream and, and even a, a command uh, some time ago uh, uh, from the, the goddess about an order of the world mother. Is exactly. That what the was? Yeah, the new order wow. of the world mother. That was exactly. And you know, it's interesting. At the time, it was right before I opened the holistic healing center called the Ruska Mansion in Baltimore, which is the oldest integrative holistic healing center in the country now. We're still in operation. At the time, I wanted to either open an orphanage or a healing center. And I'm standing there with this bowl of plums in my arms from this tree. And there she is, standing there, radiant, beautiful. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was really wow. quite awesome. Like I said, the only apparition I've ever seen. I do have visions. I am a visionary, but this was unlike, and it was very short and very powerful, and it never went away. And, you know, there isn't a time in my life I haven't thought to myself, have I done it? Have I done what I was asked? Am I living a life that's a new order of the world mother? And I feel like the order of the sacred earth is, is the same principle asking us to do the same wise action. And um, I'm very humbled that, that it has come. That's amazing. Come. Well, that's amazing. And you I thank you. Stay in touch about this. You have to stay in touch about this. Uh, no question and you about it. You a bowl it. full of plums. <laughs> uh, and the pl- and the bowl full. We had this one tree on our property that birthed all these exquisite plums. I'm standing there with the whole bowl in my arms. That tree never produced a plum again. We'll be right back. Our guest is the amazing, the wonderful Dr. Matthew Fox. You can learn more at his website, www.matthewfox.org. And please visit and take the vow. We're going to talk about why a vow is important. www.orderofthesacredearth.org. I'm Father Paul Mayer. I work for the environment, and I'm the co-founder of the Interfaith Moral Action on Climate Change. Interfaith Action on Climate Change dot org. And you're listening to twenty first century radio, hosted by Dr. Zahara Hieronymus, a wonderful interviewer who has brilliantly supported the issue I have devoted my life to, which is climate change and healing our planet. Dr. Matthew Fox is with us this evening. His recent book of many, A Way to God, Thomas Merton's Creation Spirituality Journey, a New World Library 2016 release. You can learn more about that work at www.matthewfox.org, as well as learn about something we're about to speak more about, www.orderofthesacredearth.org. You know, one of the things I like so much about your way of bringing to activism the depth of, um, I don't want to call it monasticism, I'd say spiritual commitment. Why is a vow important enough to include in something that's, um, you know, non-denominational, open to anybody, of any faith, of non-faith, etc.? Well, of course, a vow focuses us, and it focuses us around a value that we cherish. And um, I know a 26-year-old a woman responded to the idea of the order, and I presented it um, in the public place, and she said to me, you know, my generation is so dispersed by social media. We're just kind of all over the place. We need something like this. We need a focus, and this would be the perfect focus, she said. So, you know, uh, think about a marriage vow. You know, it's about focusing, uh, because obviously one can be attracted to many people but to um, uh, build a life with someone and, and just by choice to bring children in the world and so forth, uh, a, a focus uh, that a vow is about is, um, is, is a very useful thing. Gandhi took lots of vows in his lifetime. So um, I think that it's time that people who, who care, it's also, of course, a sacrificing mm-hmm. of our care of the earth. Yes. And that's important, too, because I think the real... Um, division uh, between um, caring for the earth and the animals and the and the, the, the future and so forth um, and the soil and the air and the forest and the waters and everything. And the real distinction is whether we see it as sacred or not. Uh, Thomas Berry says, you know, we will not save the earth if we don't love it, and we will not love it if we do not consider it sacred. 
And so um, it is this loss of sense of the sacred, I think, mm -hmm. that has us um, fumbling around and, and, and we're going to say distracting ourselves by paying attention to deniers uh, or by um, uh, just going about our very uh, narcissistic agenda as human beings. Pope Francis calls anthropocentrism, human centeredness, and narcissism. And I think he's right. It's a sort of species narcissism. You know, it's the, interesting about the that. The earth is here to serve us. No, it's that? very true. You know, it's interesting because it shows we have this notion. Firstly, there's this thing of dissociation. That that's that denial thing we do. It's a, I think that's the greatest psychological illness of humanity worldwide. We dissociate. We just deny what we don't like, whether it's the abuse we reap on the earth or other people or animals. But species entitlement, people claim, was a Darwinian perspective. And the truth is, he said, the greatest work in his lifetime was proving that there's no such thing as a right to species entitlement entitlement of humans, that animal are our kin. They're not less than us. They're not beneath us. They're just different from us, but we're co-collaborators. And he has been so misrepresented by the church and by political institutions, etc. And I have always found that so compelling when I finally read what he wrote about it, that no, this isn't it at all. Love was Darwin's greatest pursuit, studying what love is. So let's talk about that love of the sacred and how that has really, I mean, when I look at your work and the many times we've had the pleasure of speaking and when I read your work, that's what I see, Matthew, is that you have taken the sacredness of love and it radiates to everything we apply our will and our good intention to. Well, yeah, I think it, 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 everything does come down to love, doesn't it? You know, um, what is it we cherish, and what are we willing to stand up for? Um, one of my students, of whom I'm very proud, is Sister Dorothy Stang. Sister Dorothy Stang is a from Ohio, a um, very large Catholic farming family from Ohio. She became a sister, and she spent 42 years in the Amazon um, working with the peasants there, and, um, and of course, uh, defending the rainforest. And she was gunned down at the age of 71, I think, mm. 13 years ago. She was murdered, assassinated, murdered, really. She was a murder for ecology because she's an eco-martyr because she, she stayed. People told she was a leader down there, and, and those close to her said, you should come home, it's dangerous. You know, they're going around shooting leaders there. And um, she said, no, I will, not, I will not abandon these farmers who have a sacrosanct right to... Um, to living their, their lives uh, on the earth, on a healthy earth here, and together we're going to uh, we're going to stand up. And um, so, you know, when I think of her, I think of that line from the gospel: "You know, greater love, love than this, no one has, and to lay down their life for their friends." So her friends included the peasant farmers, but also the the soil itself and the earth itself. And she she was so excited when she came to, into our master's program because she found there a lot of uh, support for her her passion, uh, which was the love of the earth and those who are close to the earth, including the indigenous people there. And uh, like she loved Hildegard of Bingham, and uh, uh, next to her bed, mm -hmm. Hildegard was it's a Hildegard book that we produced, all marked up by her. In fact, her brothers gave it to me as a relic here. I have I can see it right across the room. And you know, how sweet. But um, so you know, love permeates everything. Once once you've kind of taken that path. Um, other things find their their place in it, and and also synchronicity happens, as you know. Um, uh, teachers show up, and and friends show up, and books show up, and all this, and 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 then we're told to start doing something, you know, develop movements and so forth, get things moving. You have a radio program, and I'm sure there's a good story behind that. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's so interesting when a person is willing to follow spirit. I mean, that's the way I kind of talk about it. I don't know enough about God to tell about God. I know a lot about spirit. Um, and the, spirit's a pretty good name for God. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe maybe these are one and the same, the presence of God as spirit. Because my experience of when we open our heart, 
and and really suspend judgment. That's the biggest problem, it seems, for most of us Westerners. We're so analytic and we're so left hemisphere. But when we can surrender judging what we see and hear and feel and just really allow ourselves to experience the it of whatever that voice is we hear telling us, asking us, guiding us, and do it. It's not enough just to hear it. Then you have to act on it. And I think that is often where it breaks down for a lot of people because it does take courage, but it also just takes faith. So can you share with us a little bit because of your deep cultivation of faith and hope? These two qualities are just so vital. And I know how overwhelmed all of us can feel at times with what seems like such opposition to the most obvious nursery school truths. Let's heal the earth. Why wouldn't we? <laughs> it makes good sense right, to preserve yeah. the planet. Ah. <laughs> Faith and hope. I know, it's I know it is. It's, it's remar- It is. That's the best way. To, it is a form of insanity, but that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think the, the key word there is, is trust. And it's out of trust that both um, faith and courage are born. And, um, in fact, trust really is, is the basic meaning, I think, of the word faith. And... Um, so you can't underestimate the power and the importance of, of trust. And, um, um, you know, uh, this deepens along the way. And it, But as you say, it also takes it takes risk to, to take action. I once had the privilege of um, being with the Fed Shuttlesworth, who was one of the civil rights leaders, um, the primary one in Birmingham during the, during the civil rights battles. And um, unlike King, he was not formally educated. He was a street minister, but uh, he's the one who convinced King to fill the jails with teenagers because the adults had been in jail a month and they were going to lose their jobs, etc. And King didn't want to do it, but he, he went along with uh, Fred and he did it. And the Ku Klux Klan blew up his home. He was in it. They also beat him three times with chains and they put his children, eight and ten years old, into jail. Oh, my Lord. Um, he was a marked man. So when I met him, we were I was asked to be in a dialogue with him about racism and ecology at the Civil Rights Museum there in Birmingham. So when I met him, I had lunch with him before we spoke publicly, and I had said I had one question. I said, where do you get your courage? And his answer was, well, you can call it courage, he said, but I call it trust. He said, when I walked out of my house, the whole roof had caved in. I said to myself, well, they can't kill me. They may kill my body someday, but they cannot kill me, and they cannot kill the movement. So I think we need, um, uh, what should I say, models of um, of courage. Uh, Sister Dorothy Stang is one such person, but certainly Fred Shuttlesworth is, and there are many others. Because well, you, we, and you I know, I, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt courage. you. I was going to say one of the examples you point to is Standing Rock, and when I interviewed some of the valve turners. Mm-hmm you know, who are just career men and women who decided they'd had enough and they shut down oil to this country for a while in the Tar Sands Pipeline. But um, Standing Rock, to me, is a beautiful current demonstration of what we're all capable of when we come together in the right way for the right reasons. That's right. And spirituality was a very deep part of that that movement. Um, I know our friends who were there, too, and, you know, that there was real prayer and... uh, ritual and so forth, and it was, you know, to sacralize our political um, uh, objections, our resistance, is very important. Um, That brings out courage, and it also brings in uh, creativity and imagination, and and that's what you want. You don't just want to face off between two reptilian brains. Exactly. One crocodile versus another. Exactly. Uh, The us and them. Or you want to invent some... (laughs) And that's why like Gandhi and King, you know, they really did something because of nonviolence. They had a method that took them deeper than the reptilian brain. Exactly. And and so much I know of my youthful activism. I started young also at 14. I'm now in my mid-60s. And at the time, I was handing out flyers for Ralph Nader and then went along for decades in that sort of horrible, angry activist role of us and them and you're wrong and we're right and mm-hmm. it took you know some some burnishing i guess of both ego and opening of heart to appreciate as i like to joke it's all of us together or it's all of us together 
<laughs> like, <laughs> that's kind of the right. truth. What's, right? the, what's the alternative? Exactly. That's right. There is. It is all of us together, regardless of how we think of it, see it, or want to treat it. It is all of us together. We're going to take a very brief break. Our guest is Dr. Matthew Fox. This is John Robbins. I am the author of Diet for a New America, The Food Revolution, No Happy Cows, and Eight Other Bestsellers. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zoe Hieronymus. It's a great show. I have been on it several times. I'm always inspired by Dr. Zoe and her thoughtfulness, her conscientiousness. She's impeccable. She knows what she's talking about. She brings great people to the airwaves, and I am really grateful for her that she does her show the way she does it. Coming back, Matthew, there were several things I wanted to ask you about, um, about the new order of the sacred earth relative to creation spirituality. And there's so many things. How am I going to do this in 15 minutes? What is the cosmic mass? Well, it's an effort to uh, reinvigorate the Western ritual, Western uh, worship, um, using postmodern art forms like DJ and VJ, um, rap, and so forth. So it's it's um, it's worship uh, through dance and through uh, we use the, the four paths of Christ So you're, you're dancing a dance of joy. You're also grieving the via negativa. You're going into grief together. That's so important today. We, we're all grieving a lot, mm-hmm. whether we know it or not, and we have to do it together uh, at times. It's not enough to just grieve alone. And then um, there is uh, the Via Creativa, and that's the, the sharing of better mind. And then the Transformativa dance at the end is about uh, getting the warrior energy up because we all have a role to play as warriors and as prophets to interfere, to stand up, to be counted, to resist. And um, so it's um, it's a redoing of the Western liturgy. And some people say, well, a Mass is such a Christian thing and, and such a Catholic thing. But the truth is, of course, that Mert Bernstein, and her Bernstein wrote a Mass, mm-hmm. and he was Jewish. And, and it's just a, a word in our Western language for worship. And, of course, uh, Bach wrote a Mass, and, and he was a uh, Lutheran. So um, it's not as narrow a thing as we made it. <laughs> exactly. And um, so uh, it'll be special, kind of this rave in the nave of the great Gothic cathedral there, at the uh, National uh, Cathedral, um, because I presume it will be quite visible. And the theme will be healing. That will be the theme of that particular Mass. Each Mass has its own theme. We've done over 100 of them all over North America, uh, most of them in the Bay Area where I live. But... Um, it, the idea of bringing rave into liturgy uh, came out of Sheffield, England, uh, way back in the 90s, and um, that's really what uh, what we've we've turned this into. And I think you know I, we've had amazing events. We did it for a thousand people at Sounds Two Conference uh, two summers ago, and um, there were Jews and uh, rabbis, several rabbis, and Hindus and Sufis and Buddhists and, and an atheist came up to me at the end, and she said, I'm a fierce atheist. I'm such a fierce atheist that when I'm walking on the street and there's a church, I cross the street <laughs> to go by the church. But she said, when we did that grieving, and then she pointed to her heart, she said, something shifted in uh-huh. She said, by the time communion came along, I had to have some. She said, this night has transformed my life. How I don't beautiful. Know what's next for me. Isn't that it wonderful? It was very moving. And again, you can go to www.matthewfox.org and www.orderofthesacredearth.org. One of the things at orderofthesacredearth.org, we mentioned the vow that one is asked to take, and I took that vow, and I signed up as a vow keeper already. I promise to be the best lover and defender of the earth that I can be. That's the vow. I also love the fact that you included these words from Martin Luther King about the beloved community. How does re-envisioning our collective humanity as the beloved community change our way of being with each other? Well, of course, that word community is a very very sacred word and a very powerful one, and I think that the science has kind of opened the door for us again because, you know, under the previous scientific worldview, it was the idea of, of survival of the fittest and the rugged individualism, et cetera, et cetera, everyone bumping up against each other. 
but today, with the rediscovery of interconnectivity and in interdependence, which, of course, is a very mystical idea, too, but today's physics is now on board. And so the potential for community, the potential for truly acting um, uh, aware of one, another's, of one another and of the needs, common needs and so forth, all this, I think, has a, has a tremendous uh, future if we, now that science is on board. And so our community is about building something together. Comunio in, in Latin means that, to build together. So we can be building alternative ways of, of doing energy, alternative ways of doing education, politics, religion, and, and the rest. And um, uh, what's there to hold us back except our own um, ideologies, maybe the bubbles, that, as we talked about earlier, that we choose to live in. But time's running out for our species, and so the beloved community is uh, is a community that puts love forward and that feels the love. I mean, the Earth has been loving us, the universe has been loving us to give birth to us. You know, in my book, Stations of the Catholic Christ, which we haven't had time to talk about, I quote Einstein on, on page 23, where he says, we're moving into a third um, uh, uh, movement of religion. The next movement of religion, he says, will be a cosmic religion. In the sense, you see that the cosmos has been loving us for 13.8 billion years, or we wouldn't be here, and this amazing Earth wouldn't be here. And the more we learn, now we've learned there are two trillion galaxies. Good heavens, this is a big place. But here we are on this little and totally special planet. And, um, and are we feeling its love, and are we returning love for love? That's the beloved community, returning love for love. But no, as we've been talking about, we tend to return um, uh, greed for love and, and rapaciousness for love. So let's, let's get down to that level of the love community. It's already here. Uh, we already live in a community. The earth is a community, and the human race is a community. But we can choose to resist, and, uh, and we're being loved, and we are lovers. And um, let's, let's get to it. You know, one of the things I discovered, and I guess like many activists my age, you know, after 40 years of trying to, to really move the, I guess, the capacity of everybody towards right action so that we make choices that are life-affirming and elevating in every situation we're in, whether it's personal, private, public, dealing with the ecosystem or how we behave in the grocery store, that it's as much about who we are internally as how we behave externally. And as I like to share with young people, it's not really what you do. It's how you do what you do. You know, if you're a street cleaner, be the best. If you're going to teach, be the best. Meaning to really reach within us to find out that which reflects the God-given grace we have. So I have a, a kind of closing question about Thomas Merton, because in your beautiful book, A Way to God, Thomas Merton's Creation Spirituality Journey, which really you, you know, write this beautiful work in a tribute to how he even, you know, educated your work, as did the 13th century mystic Meister Eckhart, whom you write about as well. You ask in the book, in your tribute, originally it began as this tribute you were asked to do, um, you, you said, what would Merton say about this time in our world? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a wonderful poem uh, by Merton. Merton, as you know, is a wonderful artist and writer and poet and many other things. But, um, and by the way, I believe he was murdered uh, and, and died a martyr as well, a martyr for peace, because he was the first American religious figure to come out against the Vietnam War. I he didn't know Dr. that. King. Yeah, he and Dr. King and Thich Nhat Hanh were very close. They were going to have a retreat at his monastery, the three of them, the weekend King was murdered. Wow. Uh, 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 King called up Merton a few days before and said, I'm sorry, I have to cancel, but get a rain check. I have to march with the garbage collectors in Memphis. And that was, of course, wow. fateful. Mm-hmm. But um, there's this wonderful poem by Merton. I think I would like to answer your question with his words. Please. Um, he says, um, um, uh, if, if he, he calls it um, first lesson about man, meaning humanity. Man begins in zoology. Of course, that's evolution. That's his acknowledgement of evolution. He is the saddest animal. He drives a big red car called anxiety. Whenever he goes to the phone to call joy, he gets the wrong number. 
Therefore, he likes weapons. He knows all guns by their right names. He drives a big black Cadillac called Death. Now he's putting anxiety into space. Merton, of course, was writing in the 60s right. before we got to the moon. He flies his worries all around Venus, but it does him no good. Man is the saddest animal. He begins in zoology and gets lost in his own bad news. <laughs> that's vintage Merton. It's, it's yeah. concrete. It's, it's easy to understand, but it's very deep. And uh, and profound, and and it stirs you. <laughs> it can stir you up. Sure. Yeah, no, it's it's beautifully fan. sad. It, it's you know, it's kind of like after I stopped being a political commentator and a whistleblower, which I did for a decade every day of the week during the Bush and Clinton eras and the beginning of the next Bush, and then I just couldn't do it anymore. But what I came away with is that we live under a preeminent death economy. I mean, everything is structured around death, our medical system, our political system, our war economy, et cetera, versus a life economy. And it's really a well, very simple that's patriarchy. turn. That's patriarchy for you. You know, yeah. um, one of the great Adrian Rich, one of the great feminist poets and philosophers, she says there's a fatalistic self-hatred involved in, in, in patriarchy, fatalistic self-hatred. And that, to me, is exactly that about a death, a death consciousness, a death economy. And um, it also links its the counter religion. I think the idea of original sin is a fatalistic self-hatred, and it, it kind of deepens that. And I think men, are, like Adrian Rich is saying, men are very prone to this. And um, I, I think that, you know, the idea of not paying attention to the destruction of the planet, that's a fatalistic self-hatred. And... Um, we, you know, we have to do some digging and some some detoxing. We have to clean this up, and and you know, men men have to wake up, and um, and ask, are we part of this system? And of course, women are too. But I think men are more prone to it. I think uh, women tend to be um, a little more life oriented. Well, it's different when you have a womb. You know, once you can create a life inside of you, you are a different kind of human than one that can't. And, um, well, there you go. There you go. You know, Dorothy Day had her conversion from being a, a very radical communist activist uh, to being a, a Christian. She said when she got pregnant, she said she was so excited to have life in her body like that that she had to thank someone. It's profound. I mean, to every mother out there, you know, I I used to call it the back door to God. You don't have to do anything other than be aware and love. You you are just, I'm just so grateful every time we have a chance to have these conversations. They're never long enough. Um, is there anything in closing we've not touched on you'd like to share? <laughs> well, um, one thing that comes to mind is in the book Stations, Cousin Christ, besides quoting Einstein, um, I'm working with two artists, M.C. Richards and Javier Garcia Limas, who've reproduced these 16 marvelous uh, stations of the IMs. Um, that's what M.C. Richards did, play tablets of the IM statements, which would mean all of us. We're all cosmic Christ. And, and Jesus is not the only Christ. We're all other Christ. And then Javier did these other stations of these events in Jesus' life. So they're, they're very beautiful to meditate on. They're very powerful. And I think this is part of bringing about what Einstein is calling about the return of a cosmic religion. Einstein, of course, is fed up with what, well, how the churches did not stand up enough against Hitler and so forth. And he said we have to move religion beyond nationalism, behind, beyond the ideology. We have to move religion into the sphere of the cosmic again. And that's where psyche and cosmos feed each other. And, and we come alive. Oh, Amen. Thank everything. you for joining us. We do have to say goodbye. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. And remember, we do need more love in the world.